Good afternoon and welcome to the National Capital Planning Commission's October 4th, 2012 meeting. And if you would please uh, stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'll note for all that today's meeting is being live streamed on the NCP website. Um, and we do have a quorum, and so without objection, we'll proceed with the agenda as has been advertised. Um, agenda item number one is the report of the chairman, and I have two items. One is we received a letter from uh, Representative Darrell Issa, chairman of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, designating John Quaderis as the first alternate, Howie Dennis as the second alternate, and Mary Pritzchow as the third alternate to the commission. Um, Howie has previously served as the third, now he's number two. Um, second item. Um, the chairman's report is that yesterday we had our third annual uh, meeting at the Pentagon with DOD, uh, specifically with the Army, Navy, and Air Force commands in the, in the Washington District. Um, uh, Commissioner Provencia, who is the DOD rep, has been instrumental in setting up these meetings as we continue to uh, work to um, further collaboration between NCPC staff and DOD uh, staff on project planning. Um, of the 158 projects we have reviewed in FY12, 40, 41 of them were DOD, so that's roughly a quarter, with GSA being number two, um, with 29 of the 158 projects. So the military-related projects are make up a, a healthy chunk of our work. Um, we stress kind of three things. One is um, getting NCPC staff involved as early as possible in project planning, certainly well before uh, preparing project budgets and doing appropriations requests. Uh, the earlier we are involved, the better those budgets and appropriations requests, the more accurate they can be. Um, second, uh, we stressed having up-to-date master plans. Uh, the Navy Yard, Joint Base, uh, Bowling and a Costume, Fort Belvoir being three of, of a number that we are still seeking, um, and progress is being made on those. And then third, uh, we cited the need to try to have uh, what's been described as staying power to those uh, master plans so that the, as installation commands change, the master plans don't continue to be changed uh, as well. So when a master plan is prepared, uh, we would like to, to work with them to see how it can survive installation command changes. <clears throat> so the meeting was, was very good. Um, everyone understood and certainly agreed with the importance of master plans and how they can help speed up individual projects. Um, and so it was a very good, uh, it was a very good meeting. Um, Mr. Acosta and uh, Shane Detman, a senior planner, and I were the three from here who attended. And again, I want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Provencia's role in, in these meetings. It's been very helpful. Um, that ends the chairman's report. Any, any questions? The third item on the agenda is a legislative update from Ms. Schuyler. I'm sorry, excuse me. Second item on the agenda is the um, executive director's report, Mr. Acosta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon. I just have a few items that I'd like to report on. Uh, first of all, before, uh, at your desk are, is a, uh, a postcard uh, announcing our Federal Urban Design Element Open House. Uh, this open house will be held on Wednesday, November 14th at the District Architecture Center um, at, on 7th Street. So we encourage all of you to attend if you are able to. Um, I'd also like to make a few new introductions uh, to our agency. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dareth Bush. Dareth, will you please stand? Uh, Dareth joined the Urban Design and Planning Review Division as a community planner. Uh, Ms. Bush uh, received dual masters in city and regional planning and architecture from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, prior to joining NCPC, uh, Ms. Bush served as principal planning technician at the Maryland uh, National Capital Park and Planning Commission. I'd also like to introduce Maureen Tai. Uh, Maureen joined the Physical Planning Division as a community planner. Um, Ms. Ty received dual masters again from City um, Regional Planning and Architecture from Georgia Tech, so that makes two. 
Um, Ms. Tai was a designer at Arc Plant Inc. Uh, before joining NCPC. So we'd like to welcome them, them to the agency. Also, I'd like to uh, announce that after 41 plus years of federal service, including more than eight years at NCPC, uh, Phyllis Vessel, our human resources officer, retired yesterday. Uh, Phyllis consistently provided the highest level of service to the staff in managing the agency's human uh, resources function. Uh, she was a great uh, HR officer and we'll certainly miss her uh, very pleasant demeanor and her very professional attitude at this agency. Uh, we wish her the best in her retirement. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. And I'd like to second Phyllis's um, that we will miss her. She has been a veteran here and she's been very good. A well-deserved retirement. Third item on the agenda is the legislative update. Ms. Schuyler. Um, I have one item to report. Uh, there on um, in late September in both the House and the Senate, uh, a new bill pertaining to the National Women's History Museum was introduced to both the House and the Senate. The, the versions in both houses are identical. The idea is behind the bill is to create a, um, a commission to study the establishment of a museum and report back to Congress and the President. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for Ms. Schuyler? The fourth item on the agenda is the consent calendar, and we have two items. First is item 4A, um, is the yards, the Southeast Federal Center parcel in. And item 4B is the transfer of jurisdiction of a triangular portion of land bordered by Constitution Avenue, Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest, and the National Gallery of Art West Building. Um, any questions on either of those two items? Hearing none, is there a motion on the consent calendar? It's been moved and seconded. All in favor of the consent calendar being passed, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Calendar is adopted. <coughs> Fifth item on the, uh, the agenda item 5A, the fifth item on the agenda 5A is amendments to the federal environment element of the comprehensive plan. Uh, we have Mr. Zayden. Welcome. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon. Um, the first agenda item in the open session is the final policy adoption for the update to the federal environment element. As many of you are aware, we are working uh, through the existing comprehensive plan to update the elements and, and to evaluate the policies that they contain. And just to kind of give you a, a quick status of where we are, these are all starting to kind of come to a head. So the transportation element was, the, the final policy adoption was complete in June uh, through this commission's action. The environment element is before you today. Um, next month at the November commission meeting, we will be bringing the draft urban design element to you. Uh, this is an, a brand new element for the comprehensive plan, and we've been working with the Urban Design Task Force uh, to create uh, that element. Um, so that will be coming to you for a draft release, and there will also be a public event held on November 14th for that element, as our executive director mentioned. Um, concurrent with that, the release of that element, we will also be requesting the release of the update to the historic preservation element. Because there's such a significant overlap between the preservation and parts of the urban design element, we thought it would be good to release those drafts um, concurrently. Uh, they are still separate elements, but go through the public process at the same time. And then uh, beyond that, uh, we are working on the visitors and foreign missions elements, and we are targeting a December for their draft presentation. Um, we are working to finalize the workplace element, and we are also targeting December for the finaling of that, that, that piece. And then the final element to be updated will be the open space and parks element, and we'll begin uh, updating that in 2013. So lots, lots forthcoming uh, related to the comprehensive plan. Um, the today's agenda item is the federal environment element. Uh, this element was last updated in 2004, and it provides uh, policy recommendations on best management practices and goals for environmental stewardship for federal agencies throughout the national capital region. Um, like all the rest of the elements in the comprehensive plan, it has specific policy recommendations as well as aspirational statements. Uh, it also, uh, many of the policies also overlap with other elements of the comprehensive plan, uh, particularly in this case, the transportation element and uh, some of the recommendations we have for the urban design work. Uh, but since 2004, uh, there has been uh, some advancement and some work done throughout the, uh, the federal government as it regards to environmental stewardship, and this is what we wanted to account for in our update. Uh, in 2007, the Energy Independence and Security Act was signed, which uh, provided uh, very strict regulations regarding energy conservation and building design for the federal government. 
Uh, this was followed by Executive Order 13514, which we all know is a sustainability executive order, which built upon um, the, the 2007 law to really provide stricter and stronger policy guidance to federal agencies in managing their environmental impacts. Also, the Chesapeake Bay and Anacostia River programs uh, have been initiated. There's a strong Chesapeake Bay uh, program that was embodied in an executive order. The district's been working uh, very hard on, on uh, cleaning up and revitalizing the Anacostia River. We wanted to reflect that work as well. Um, also, climate change has become a very uh, substantial issue. Um, work from the Environmental Protection Agency and uh, the Metropolitan Washington, Washington Council of Governments has really provided some strong policy direction on, on the realm of climate change, and we wanted to reflect that in this update, as well as advances in scientific research and new best practices for environmental impacts. Um, stemming from the uh, sustainability executive order, uh, every federal agency has to publish a strategic sustainability performance plan. Um, and as an informational piece, we wanted to reflect NCPCs uh, in the environment element. Um, and some of the uh, policy uh, points in our strategic plan include updating and expanding the federal elements of the conference of plan, which, uh, which we're working on. Uh, working closely with the uh, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments and advancing the Greater Washington 2050. Um, we feel like this is, this is part of our sustainability work. Um, developing a precinct scale eco district plan for 10th Street and Maryland Avenue Southwest. This uh, we're pursuing in the eco district project, which, which you know, you're aware of. And also implementing operational standards to help reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And kind of an interesting bragging point, I guess, currently over 95% of NCPC employees walk, bike, or take public transportation to work. So uh, we're doing pretty well in that, in that realm, and we wanted to reflect this in the environment element. Uh, so getting to the policies themselves, there are 12 existing policy areas ranging from air quality to soils and vegetation to radio frequency um, or uh, telecommunication antennas. Um, we went through and evaluated these areas. Um, to just update the policies and see if they're consistent with current best practices. We are proposing three new policy areas, um, one being climate change, two being light pollution, and three being energy conservation. Uh, the entire update is included in your EDR, and I'm just going to highlight some of the updates and then pay particular attention to these three new policy areas. Um, to the existing areas, um, particularly floodplains, wetlands and watersheds, soil and wildlife, we built on the, the current approach in the environment element, which is to avoid uh, impacts, protect these resources, and mitigate any impacts that may, uh, may happen. Um, there is an environmental justice section of this element that provides policy guidance to federal agencies. Um, and this section uh, provides policies which require open evaluation of alternatives and really reinforce what is required in the National Environmental Policy Act uh, as it regards to public participation. Uh, we did strengthen the policies in the vegetation uh, section, which we're now calling vegetation and tree canopy. The district has a very strong uh, tree canopy. The District of Columbia's tree canopy increased 2.1% since 2006, with, it, with, with a now coverage of 37.2%. And the district has a goal of 40% by 2035, so obviously coming uh, very, very close to meeting that goal within that time frame. Um, the update to the policies include a stronger focus on preserving and expanding the tree camp canopy regionally, um, replace trees and compensate for tree canopy loss. Uh, we do recommend a one-to-one -one replacement for most trees in, envir in environmental um, or in federal projects, and also um, respecting local standards and guidelines for tree protection. Uh, many of the local communities um, around the national capital region are really focusing their zoning codes and their regulations on preserving trees, and we think the federal government should strive to meet some of these regulations. Um, a new section that we've added is climate change, and the element does reflect the uh, EPA's definition of climate change, which is, and I'll just read part of this, but climate change refers to any significant change in the measures of climate lasting for an extended period of time. Uh, we did want to build upon the EPA's work uh, regarding climate change. Um, Climate change really impacts, uh, covers a lot of realms, so these policies um, overlap with other pieces of the comp plan as well as within the environment element itself. But the policies focus on long-range planning for flooding, runoff, and soil erosion and temperature extremes. It encourages sustainable building design. Um, it does set a zero net energy standard by 2030, and this is something that comes out of the 2007 uh, ESA law. Um, it encourages district-level energy planning, uh, which is something we've seen in the eco-district and other projects. 
and it supports continued analysis of the impacts of climate change on the national capital region. So it sets a foundation for establishing partnerships to uh, study the impacts of climate change. Another new policy area is light pollution. Um, the, in updating this, the environment element and studying this issue, we looked at um, some scientific research on how light pollution can disrupt migratory patterns. It weakens the cleansing of particulate matter in the atmosphere, and basically you can also waste energy when you're using lighting that is unnecessary. So the new policies look to eliminate upward and horizontal spillage of light, uh, provide appropriate light controls, and respect the effects and impact of light on adjacent areas and surrounding context. This is also something that we've gotten into in the urban design element. So it just really uh, sets uh, some standards for managing uh, lighting use for federal uh, agencies. Uh, the final new area is uh, involving energy conservation, and we really wanted to reflect many of the uh, standards set in the 2007 uh, Energy Independence and Security Act, or ESA. Um, and the new policies look to reduce fossil fuel generated energy consumption by 55%. Uh, 30 percent of hot water in federal buildings should come from solar energy, and again, reiterates the need to encourage district light level uh, energy planning uh, to uh, pool resources and conserve energy. In terms of process, uh, we have held a public comment period, which ran from June 11th uh, after the commission uh, released the draft element. Uh, that comment period ran from June to August, and we did re receive some comments, and those were reflected in your EDR. Uh, a public meeting was held on June 27th so that we could present uh, the draft update. Uh, the policies were tweaked after the comment period was closed. Um, a draft narrative has been added and will continue to be edited as the comp plan is compiled. And this is kind of the process that we're going through to, and, and updating the entire comp plan is to keep working on the narrative before it's all finalized, at which time we'll bring it back to the commission for uh, a full adoption. Uh, so the commission action requested is that the commission adopt the updated policies to the federal environment element, but hold those policies in abeyance until all of the federal elements of the comprehensive plan uh, are, are adopted and the comp plan can be compiled, uh, which, again, at which time we'll bring back to you for a final adoption of the entire document. So that's the end of my presentation, and, and I believe we do have one person signed up to speak. So. We do indeed. Um, we have one person signed up to speak, Mr. Lindsley Williams. Mr. Williams, welcome. As you're representing yourself, you have three minutes. Members of the commission, my name is Lindsley Williams, sometimes known as Trouble. Uh, and I'm here to actually support the adoption that's been recommended, holding things in abeyance, but to bring to your attention three things that came to my attention as I reviewed the document over the weekend. I had two oh my moments and one bingo moment. And the two uh, oh my moments relate to the statement of the goal, which I found incredibly uninspiring. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I t took a crack uh, at trying to give you some words. I don't want you to take what I've written as my, take it or leave it, but to just sort of put it before you that these are things that need attention. And the goal, it seems to me, is one of those areas that needs attention. The second area that needs attention, I'm thinking of, uh, particularly of the D.C. contribution to the effort in the Southwest Eco District, is to get it more fully recognized. Um, and that will be coming up to you for adoption uh, in, I believe, January. So I think it all fits with the timeline that David uh, identified to you in the slides. And the final thing, um, which was my sort of bingo moment, was the realization that as, as we all struggle to meet the requirements of the uh, uh, stormwater management system, uh, management re requirements that are uh, honest because of EPA and because of the problem that they're trying to address, we need to see if there's a way to figure out uh, ways of accessing what I call for the moment, and not having a better term, um, <clears throat> unessential, that's not surplus, unessential federal lands so that they could be multi-purposed into solving environmental problems, particularly those relating to stormwater, as well as getting on with their primary purpose of whatever the installation is in question, and at the same time not getting all, uh, not causing security issues. and. That's what the gist of my letter is all about. I don't want to try to read the letter, and you also have a supplemental letter, I believe, from um, uh, David Tuckman, who was explaining in perhaps a little more detail than I did what this is all about. I think that what David has recommended, David Zayden has recommended, the executive director has recommended, is hold these things, modify them as the plans are developed, 
and I see all three of these things as being something that are potentially amenable to be included and would ask you to sort of nudge staff in that direction, but basically go forward with the adoption that's before you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Williams, very much. Um, anyone have any comments or questions for Mr. Williams? We will, is it, Peter, I'm sorry. Yeah, press the button to your, <clears throat> what's that one? Got it. Still getting used to the new microphones. Uh, I just, I wanted to understand better from you what you regard as unessential land. I, I'm not proud of that word, Mr. May. I, um, but uh, what I was trying to do is to make sure I did not use the word surplus because that sets off all kinds of alarm bells and it makes it sound like it's not needed. But I'm thinking of a range of things that could occur to, to both give value and solve problems. Um, there are perimeter issues, places that involve a buffer strip. Thirty years ago, I was involved uh, with an, an effort to uh, find a solution to a chiller plant that Metro wanted to put into uh, the middle of a residential community of Woodland Park. We found a solution for that by putting it in the buffer, by suggesting and then getting approvals for putting it into the buffer strip of the National Zoological Park. You, Mr. May has brought before you some ideas about trying to figure out what we can do to get better grass to grow on the mall. And right now the mall, particularly the western part of the mall, is sitting on muck, which was dredged up, and it's not very good at absorbing water. And it's the kind of thing which if it were repurposed so that it had a really good kind of preparation for it, it could probably become a receiving zone for water and not cause the runoffs that we're experiencing. Well, that's valuable to people that have to meet this EPA requirement and it's not, it's, it's, it's not essential if, if you can get under it and use it and still have the green surface for the people of America to walk on. And I look at installations of the Defense Department, which have considerable acreage, and I'm presuming that there are locations within that which might be uh, wetlands or could be made to better hold back water from cascading down the Anacostia or down Rock Creek. There's an, out, there's an outfall in the upper end of, of Rock Creek Park, which is getting scoured a lot. Um, there may be things that can be done with that. And all I'm trying to do is say, let's see if there's a way in which federal lands and the stewards of those lands can partner with those that have problems that need to be solved and have two problems solved at once instead of just one set of requirements that is imposed, which can sometimes prove to be really nettlesome in the development world. That's what I had in mind. Uh, okay, yeah, I guess you have, need to work on what the right word is, but we do because the, the you know what you talked about that might occur on parkland are certainly uses that we are we are looking at on a regular basis, but we would never want to characterize that land as as unessential. Um, yeah. No, and I wouldn't want you to either. Right. So okay. Um, I, I'm also I would be concerned if there was a mandate to to do those and, things for other and, agencies. It's it, we're doing it now on a voluntary basis, and we see the value in it. We want to do everything we can to help our federal partners when we can. Uh, and we've had some discussions about taking on extra water, for example, in certain areas. Well, I, hope, um, I hope the members of the commission saw that what I was trying to suggest was not a mandate, but basically a right to knock on the door and say, may we? Right. That's what I wanted to see if we could yeah. get it more formally expressed so that as opportunities and constraints come along, that there's something in writing that says this is a good thing to try. I, I, I think that um, you can be encouraged by the fact that a lot of those conversations are already happening, um, driven by a number of causes. I mean, our, our biggest cause might be the idea of eliminating the, uh, uh, the Potomac Tunnel that's part of the long-term control plan now known as the Clean Rivers Project, which would have tremendous and, and devastating impacts on portions of Rock Creek and um, the CNO Canal Park if it's built the way it's conceived right now. Thanks. Um, I think this is a really intriguing idea. And I think the concept that you might be trying to convey is that whatever the primary purpose of the federal land might be, that it might also be able to serve that primary purpose and serve additional purposes that have an environmental benefit. 
And I think that that really is, uh, you know, is, a, is a, an important concept to sort of put out there. Um, uh, Twenty percent of the land in the city is parkland. Most of that is federal. Twenty percent of the land is roads and, and alleys and driveways. Uh, we're looking as a city at repurposing our streets, our rights of way, to see could they do more to benefit the environment, including actually managing and storing stormwater. So I think I think it would be a, an important uh, contribution to look at all the lands that are available in the city to see if we could uh, put them to additional purposes that might be mutually beneficial. And I think it's a great suggestion. If I might just add, I, I, first of all, I wish I'd had you as a co-author. But uh -huh. s second, I did not restrict my remarks to district-located federal lands. It seems to me that if we can do this, and so we're trying to do an a policy element for the region, and if there's a solution that can be had up the Anacostia, and if it's in Prince George's County but still on federal land, and it helps meet the, the problems of the, helps address the problems of the Anacostia as well as a development site in the district, I don't see that it should be off limits. <clears throat> My own? Come on. I missed the training session for that last month. Um, good afternoon. Uh, Lindsay, I think uh, those are, uh, all three of your suggestions are worthy of consideration, and I would add my voice to yours to, and others to nudge the staff to maybe incorporate them somehow. But my question is, did you offer these comments previously during the public comment period? No. Uh, I have to confess that uh, that's why I identified myself as trouble. <laughs> that I did not see these things until I did a final read over the weekend. Um, and the other factor that came to mind, uh, particularly as to the third item of this multi-purposing or whatever, um, I've just become increasingly aware of the difficulty being faced by the pending stormwater uh, regulations. And so there was, to use another aquatic term, a confluence of, of, <laughs> of factors that led me to do this. And I saw the opportunity to make these comments, first it's a public session, but more particularly, the nature of the process of being recommended by your director is to hold all of these things in abeyance. And I said, there's the window of opportunity. I can make comments and not derail the train. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, would it be appropriate for, um, uh, I guess, the commission action is final adoption. Should we put a motion out that might be amended? <coughs> Yeah, I, was, I, was, I was actually going to ask if the action is for final adoption but we're holding it in abeyance, what position does that put us in to consider some arguably minor but important uh, changes? You can either make the amendments right now or, as Mr. Zayden also mentioned, you will be seeing the final plan um, when it's all complete and then you'll be adopting that. We could also point out where we had made the changes. Uh, in that document um, in the future. So you could do either. So there's still time, even if Yeah, we... there's still time to change it, because okay. we're going to, as uh, David noted, we're going to change some of the narrative. Yep. Um, also, uh, there may be other things we find. So you'll have another shot at uh, making corrections. But if you want us to uh, do it, you could also make the... Yeah, and, instead of us trying to make uh, changes on the fly, um, why don't we, I think staff has got the sense of the commission that we're more than mildly interested in um, Mr. L Mr. Williams' suggestions. Perhaps we give some considered thought to it and work with Mr. Williams uh, as well and maybe bring back amendments uh, later. Is that okay? Ms. Tregoning, is that all right? I'm just looking at the, lang the language of the commission action, which is final adoption of the updated policy. So I'm just trying to figure out. Yeah, that was. That was the point of my question as well. What, we call it what interim adoption. Yeah, what posture does that put Well, us when in? we bring the full document back um, for final adoption and to put it into effect, we can, we can, as part of that commission action, point out any changes to the policies that may have occurred from the previous adoption, if that makes can sense. Can we just so. call it adoption and not final adoption? Can I make that amendment once we've got the motion? Yeah, I mean, that's fine. We'll make this a point of the EDR. This change and any other ones that may come up before we bring the whole thing to you. We'll make that a point of the EDR when we bring it back. I guess the point would be uh, either we could wordsmith it right now to reflect kind of the final policies or just bring it back to you when the whole thing comes together. We could point out what the changes are and you adopt it, but we could take out the final, I think, what... 
ok well l let me let me get the sense of staff do you want us to lay this on the table for temporarily for this meeting let you guys look at it and maybe adopt it now and get it over with or hold off and work on it a little bit then bring it back uh, when we adopt the the final final document I think you could adopt it today I think Harriet's uh, Mr. Gowning's suggestion to yep. take strike a final off okay, it, which right. just give you some assurance that not everything is settled uh, we'll okay. bring the entire comp plan back to you early next year for final adoption so that would just make it clear to everybody and they'll also point out where the changes have been made uh, to reflect Mr. Williams comments at okay. that time all right is there a motion to on the EDR to amend the EDR to strike the word final it's been moved and seconded. All in favor of that amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That amendment to the EDR is adopted. Any further discussion? Mr. Hart. Uh, this is not with the uh, amendment of the EDR. Okay. I, I was uh, pleased to see the inclusion of climate change in this environmental element. What I was looking for in that discussion was really a bit more pointed dis um, objectives of assessing what the the hazards that climate change may impose on the environment uh, that we've become accustomed to. In particular, uh, the potential rise in sea level and its uh, effect on the shoreline and you know infrastructure and things like that in the shoreline. Um, I would encourage that you know in the support of the analysis impacts that there be a lot more attention given to potential future land impacts of climate change and in particular uh, sea level rise. Uh, one foot of sea level rise creates a, a dramatic change to the shoreline, to the areas that are subject to uh, inundation and, and flood hazard. And I've heard predictions of six to 12 feet over the next century of rise. I don't know how legitimate those predictions are, but I think that given the fact that there is a history of increasing uh, sea level uh, across the globe and the effects of, of climate on the polar ice caps, that some analysis be given to, you know, what is the potential impact, whether it is realistic or, you know, projected simply based on uh, some of the, the past history, I think would be very useful. And we are a planning agency. We look to the future and we try to study the, you know, the worst case scenarios and how to to prevent that. Okay. So I, I applaud the inclusion of the climate change. I would like to see you know, it, it become the beginning of some significant analysis. Okay. Thank you. Other comments? I had just one question for Mr. Zayden. I noticed in the public comment section, what few public comments there were, they were all concentrated on solid waste and, uh, and recycling. And our general response was, we don't have authority over solid waste and recycling. Yet elsewhere in the document, we do talk about solid waste and recycling, yeah. uh, mostly in terms of environmental justice. And then in our planning documents, we, mm. not unlike the Southwest Echo District, we get into it. So, so there's not a disconnect okay. between the public comment and other evidence to the contrary. Mm. Can you explain in context why we don't have authority mm -hmm. in terms of what they were asking, yet we do address solid right. waste and recycling? Yeah, and, and maybe maybe I didn't word it correctly in those responses, but essentially my understanding of the public comments they were about the certification yeah. of recycling centers and solid waste management centers and the the US EPA and other agencies certify those types of establishments we don't the policies in the comp plan are more about what federal agencies should do to manage their okay. their solid waste better not so much the certification of facilities if that makes sense yeah I was just looking for some clarification and all right sensing no additional questions or comments um, is there a motion on adopting as amended the EDR on the federal on the uh, um, environmental elements? It's been moved and seconded. All in favor of the amended EDR say aye. 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 Opposed, no. It's unanimously adopted. Thank you, Mr. Zayden, mm -hmm. uh, very much. Uh, item 5B on the agenda is the new commissary at Fort Belvoir, and we have Mr. Wheel. Welcome. Good afternoon. 
Uh, this is a new commissary project to be located uh, on the north post portion of Fort Belvoir in Fairfax County, Virginia. Uh, this project is submitted by the Department of the Army for a preliminary building and site uh, development plan review. So Fort Belvoir is located approximately 12 miles south of Washington, D.C., uh, just to the east of I-95. Here's a map that shows uh, the fort uh, and the, the uh, project location is shown uh, with the red circle um, as being on North Post. And here's a close-up uh, air photo uh, showing the existing condition. Um, there is the, the post exchange building and the existing commissary building. And there's a, there's a larger uh, planning effort to plan a, a, a North Post town center, uh, which requires the shifting of uh, the post exchange building and the, and the commissary building to the northwest. Uh, now, the Commission reviewed uh, the post exchange project uh, three different times uh, during 2010 and 2011. Um, the the uh, future post exchange center is currently uh, undergoing construction and is scheduled for um, uh, opening in 2013. Once that facility is operational, the existing post exchange building uh, shown there will be demolished in the future commissary building will be uh, relocated on the site of the existing uh, post exchange building so during the Commission review of the post exchange uh, there were uh, several Commission concerns uh, related to that project uh, in in particular the the large-scale uh, tree removal um, required by that project uh, the stormwater management plans uh, and also uh, a, a seemingly lack of uh, of, uh, uh, of design to the proposed town center uh, plan. This was uh, essentially the placeholder design that was uh, included in the environmental assessment, which was done in 2010 for that North Post Town Center. You will note the, the proposed or the future post exchange as the red square uh, and the future commissary building uh, as the blue square. So, uh, you know, in response to the commission concerns over the, the the, the poor design uh, of the North Post Town Center. The Army worked with NCPC staff uh, to um, uh, refine that, that town center concept. Uh, the direction we were given uh, due to the relatively late uh, planning stages, uh, re relatively late in the planning process for both, both the post exchange building and the commissary, uh, as well as the financial constraints uh, for the, the PX and the commissary. Uh, the direction we were given was that the, while those two pieces were essentially fixed uh, as to their forms, the rest of the post town center uh, was a relatively clean slate. And, and uh, NCPC staff worked very closely with uh, the Army to try to, to, to redesign that portion of the town center. So we looked uh, at some existing examples of uh, successful, uh, well, relatively uh, existing and, and planned uh, town center like developments within the region um, all of these town center developments uh, cater to both uh, a, a regional clientele as well as a local clientele uh, which is similar to the North Post Town Center and the Army redesigned uh, the North Post Town Center uh, to to uh, reflect a better design uh, they incorporated a better circulation network throughout the development uh, they incorporated several uh, special nodes where uh, some, some uh, uh, special placemaking attention would, would uh, enter into their design. Uh, they really increased their mix of uses in the new town center development. Uh, in particular, they, they added some housing, which is shown in blue. They also took a step back and really made an effort to uh, uh, really foster more, more walking, more, more bicycling, and more transit usage between the existing and planned uh, uses uh, uh, directly adjacent to the new town center, uh, in particular south of Gorgas Road uh, and, and the relatively large uh, residential uh, development lo located to the southeast of the development known as Lewis Village. One of the other uh, significant design improvements that came out of that effort was uh, the, the design of a pedestrian promenade that was intended to uh, entice walkers to walk uh, between the more regional uh, uses, the PX Center and the commissary, and the rest of the more local uh, town, more local uh, uh, town center development. 
and I'll show you that uh, in a few slides. So here's the actual uh, commissary building. Uh, this shows the, the, the typical uh, red brick facade that is uh, uh, pretty standard uh, throughout Fort Belvoir. Uh, this appearance meets the, the installation design guidelines uh, and is, is uh, very, uh, fairly similar to the PX shopping center. Here's a proposed floor plan uh, for the new 140,000 square foot commissary building. Uh, this is being designed to meet uh, LEED Silver certification uh, with a cool roof, uh, primarily on the ground level, and there, there will be a, a 7,500 square foot uh, elevated mezzanine level for staff only. Here's a larger uh, commissary site development plan. Uh, you can see the, the, the commissary building will be situated in between the new uh, PX shopping center to the left. Uh, and the rest of the, the, the future town center development to the right. Uh, I should note that, uh, that uh, the north is uh, to the left side of the slide. Uh, in particular, with, in this particular site uh, plan, I want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, there will be a, a shared uh, single-use parking facility for customers uh, intended to be shared uh, by both the PX center and the commissary. So the commissary, the, the customer parking for the commissary will uh, essentially just be expanding um, the, the PX uh, center uh, customer lot to the south. Here's a closer view uh, of a site plan. Uh, commercial loading and vendor parking provided uh, along the east side of the commissary uh, in the rear of the building. Uh, a separate employee parking lot uh, with 66 spaces uh, provided to the south as well as future expansion space. Uh, and again, the, the 522 uh, customer parking lot located uh, along the west side of the building. Here's the pedestrian promenade uh, forecourt area that will be located uh, directly in front of the commissary building. Uh, and again, this, this was uh, a design improvement that came out of the, um, the, the, the redesign of the North Post Town Center development effort. Here's a close-up of that pedestrian promenade, and again, this will provide a, a, a critical segment as part of that, that pedestrian spine uh, that will encourage uh, walkers between the, um, uh, the, the, the more local uses to the south and the PX Center and the new commissary. You can see the original design to the bottom. Uh, it was primarily designed uh, simply as a, uh, an, um, uh, an impervious uh, plaza. Uh, the new design, uh, uh, still consists of that uh, decorative uh, stamped concrete. However, there's a lot more seating uh, included now, uh, a lot more pervious surface through planting beds, uh, and, and an effort was really made to try to green it up uh, to provide more of a park-like setting, uh, an environment, a space where people would want to, uh, to gather and, and congregate and, and to walk. Here's some renderings showing that, that newly uh, designed space. This is uh, looking north towards the PX Shopping Center uh, with the commissary on the right. This is looking uh, southeast uh, back across the space towards uh, one of the uh, proposed commissary entrances. And this is a stepped back elevated view looking to the northwest. Uh, you can see the, the uh, proposed AP's um, PX Shopping Center building to the left and the commissary building to the right. So with that, staff reviewed the site uh, development plan. Uh, staff noted that, that the proposed customer lot is 80 spaces uh, fewer than the existing customer lot for the commissary. Um, the commissary, the proposed commissary space is uh, approximately 8% larger than the existing uh, commissary. And the parking that, that is provided in the current site plan uh, does is less than, than the amount of uh, customer parking that would be uh, uh, required by Fairfax County for a, a similar uh, size development. Staff also noted that, that, the, that the proposed customer parking uh, will be a part of a, a shared use uh, single uh, parking lot to try to encourage as, as, as efficient of a, a customer utilization as possible. However, uh, staff has requested from the Army uh, more detailed uh, customer demand forecast information uh, to really ensure that uh, that, that customer lot is uh, as, as minimal as possible. Staff also questioned the need for a fully separate uh, employee lot, uh, 
lot as well and, and was wondering if that employee parking uh, could also be accommodated in the, in the, um, the shared uh, customer lot as proposed. In terms of stormwater management, uh, the applicant has indicated that, that the site design will meet Fairfax County, Commonwealth of Virginia, ESA, and Chesapeake Bay Protection Act standards. Uh, however, due to the preliminary uh, nature of the design, uh, uh, it has not been finalized uh, to a point yet where uh, you, can, you can see those definitive values and, and really um, um, ensure that, that, that it will meet those uh, design standards. Uh, staff notes that the proposed design will uh, utilize pervious concrete spaces, uh, similar to the PX uh, shopping center parking lot, uh, which will help uh, reduce the, the amount of stormwater uh, impacts. Um, the parking lot will utilize bioswales and other low impact uh, de uh, development features as much as possible. And again, uh, staff wanted to bring to your attention the uh, the improved uh, forecourt area, pedestrian promenade area, uh, which now has uh, a significantly uh, a better design and a lot more pervious surface than, than the existing uh, design. And it really kind of ties uh, both the commissary and the PX Center in uh, um, uh, more um, uh, uh, successfully into the rest of the town center design. Mr. Wheel? Uh, yes. Further define how much pervious concrete or pervious space is there um, in the great scheme of things relative to the first design and what is you know how much additional is there now than what was proposed well I, I can tell you that um, approximately 68 percent of the surface area the parking surface area uh, will be pervious concrete okay that's helpful compared with zero percent uh, okay. before that, that's helpful thank you <clears throat> However, uh, uh, staff received um, uh, in, an incomplete uh, uh, information package related to the, the project's reforestation uh, and has uh, requested additional information uh, from the Army on that, uh, that re their reforestation plans uh, for the project. Uh, and again, staff noted that due to the preliminary nature of the stormwater design, uh, staff wanted to, to hold off on uh, recommending approval uh, to ensure that it, it, it will, uh, in fact, meet all those um, various uh, uh, design standards. So with that, it is the, the executive director's recommendation to the commission to approve the preliminary building plans for the new commissary, but to defer action on the preliminary site development uh, plans due to inadequate information on the, on the applicant's reforestation plan as well as proposed parking and stormwater management plan. And to request that prior to submitting for preliminary and final approval of site development plans for the commissary, the applicant should include the, should provide the following. Information on the tree reforestation plan being developed for the master plan update. Uh, documentation on the project's uh, compliance with stormwater management standards from Fairfax County, Commonwealth of Virginia, ESA, and Chesapeake Bay Protection Restoration Act and a detailed uh, forecast of projected customer de demand for the shared parking lot to recommend the elimination of a separate employee lot uh, and to note that the applicant has worked with NCPC staff on the development of a North Post Town Center small area plan in response to previous commission comments and concerns uh, but that that final North Post uh, Town Center plan will not be available until a draft master plan uh, is submitted to the commission for for review in early 2013 and that concludes my presentation i'm now available to answer any questions uh, and we also have chris landgraf here from fort belvoir uh, who can answer any questions as well thank you thank you i have i have one question if the employee parking lot is eliminated is that to say it'll become green space or what is anticipated if well it's not? well that that is our hope our hope that by having a a, a shared use facility uh, that facility will have um, the, the, uh, an appropriate number of parking spaces that can accommodate that, that, uh, that employee parking as well to create a more efficient parking facility. And yes, our hope would be that that space would be, would be green and would be additional pervious space. And also, people wouldn't have to necessarily walk across the parking lot to, to reach the rest of the town center development. Questions or comments for Mr. May? 
Um, on the same subject, the employee parking lot, I, I, there was a leap of logic that I missed somehow in my reading of the EDR in that the, uh, it is noted that the employee parking lot is larger than NCPC standards or our standards. Um, and there was no explanation of why that simply means the best thing to do is to eliminate it entirely. I mean, there's certainly some logical, practical reasons why one would want to have a separate employee parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, and having worked at a facility similar to this a million years ago, the, uh, you know, the policy was always, well, the employees had to park farthest away so the customers could park closer. But that's not a very easy thing to enforce. <coughs> so I'm wondering what the logic is of, sim of not wanting to have any kind of separate um, employee parking. Well, the, the, basically, that was a recommendation based on the, the parking demand information that we have, uh, which is, is really no information. We just want to make sure that, that, the, that the, 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 the amount of pervious surface is as minimal as possible in light of the past history of the PX shopping uh, center project. And so, you know, that was just a thought on our part that, you know, maybe that could be eliminated until proven otherwise. And so, so it was just an attempt to get rid of 66 parking spaces or whatever the right, number was. Right, right, correct. And, and, and really make sure that, that any sort of pervious. Because, because you thought there were 66 too many spaces? Because the only thing it says in the report is that there are seven too many or something like that. Right, right. Well, I, I did note, correct, that, that, that the proposed employee parking uh, did exceed that parking ratio goal in the, in the comprehensive plan. Right. Um, but, but again, uh, in an effort to try to uh, minimize the, the amount of pervious surface on site, uh, w you know, maybe that, that parking, that separate parking lot could be fully eliminated and that employee parking could be accommodated, uh, you know, within the, the larger shared parking facility. I have a question. Uh, okay. Excuse me. Hey, were you finished? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I go ahead. Back. How does Fort Belvoir feel about this? What was the rationale? Uh, do we have anyone to answer that question? Or do we have a Fort Belvoir representative? I would really like to know. Uh, before you speak, I just want to make one thing aware, all of you. Pervious surface, I'm, I'm a, an incredible environmentalist. I believe in what you all believe, but I'm also a structural expert. And I want to make everyone aware that pervious concrete has absolutely zero structural value. In order for it to make it work, we have to have the right base, or if we don't have the right base for it, we have to build the right base. Otherwise, we will have severe problems. So. When we talk about that the six parking spaces could not be accommodated as they are or be pervious, non-pervious, I would like to know what, how it, the requirements came about, or how do you feel about the ratios, which I have a hard time to deal with too, mm -hmm. when we were just building our TMP for the Pentagon. So I would like to see what led you to actually asking for those parking spaces. Could you please, any one of you, or both of you answer this question? Uh, we, we originally requested the spaces based on the uh, total um, employee staffing load for the largest shift. Uh, we recognize the fact that we have uh, between 60 and 70 full-time permanent employees, and then we have about 53 during the peak shift uh, temporary employees that uh, come in in two four-hour shift uh, changeover times. So the parking load was uh, requested based on that. It was also uh, based on um, the fact that during that time we have vendors uh, and uh, companies that actually come in during the, the morning and the afternoon to restock based on heavy demand. And so um, what wasn't clearly submitted to the, uh, to the commission and to the staff, and um, our design team is actually looking back into it based on Michael's question, is that um, we do actually need some of those parking spaces to be designated specifically for the vendor parking so that they can come in the back side of the inst they're, they're coming in smaller vehicles than tractor trailers. So they would need spaces that are dedicated for them to be able to offload their materials, bring it into the back side, restock the shelves, and then leave again. And that actually occurs throughout the day according to the current commissary operations manager. 
Um, and so we're re-looking at it based on Michael's comment. Uh, I would like to point out, and I did uh, bring this to Michael's attention just yesterday afternoon, that the, the reason that we had placed the employee parking on that portion of the uh, design plan was because it also serves as a secondary use for uh, emergency vehicle access. This is a 140,000 square feet facility, as Michael said. The front part of it is actually a two-story facility. Um, and so we need three-side access to this facility for firefighting purposes should that ever have to occur. So we really won't be able to eliminate, even if we eliminate the parking or we minimize it to the maximum extent practical and get it back under our standards, um, there will most likely have to be a drive aisle on that side that is at least 24 feet wide to accommodate a uh, ladder truck uh, given the size of this facility. So we we're looking at it and we uh, do agree that we had seven parking spaces too many listed uh, and we've already brought that to the design team and are prepared to deal with that question in the final submission. And, and also, I just wanted to add one thing. What I told Chris on the phone is, uh, you know, hopefully this will this will answer Mr. May's question. Um, but, you know, again, we just want to know if that employee lot could be separate, you know, could be fully eliminated. Um, I think the reason why I still pointed out the fact that there were too many parking spaces based on the ratio was that if it can't be eliminated, um, you know, due to requirements, such as Chris just said, you know, I was just noting that it, it was still too many employee spaces, uh, you know, uh, for that separate parking lot. So if the Army decides that they do need, you know, a, a fully separate employee lot, uh, then they should note that, you know, based on the goal, uh, they, they should have no more than 59 spaces. And, and we agree that we are relooking at the so parking requirement. And okay. again, going to fully identified employee spaces versus flag okay. spaces that are specifically for vendors, which would be uh, co-located but marked so that they're not for employee parking. Um, and then with re-answer to your question, we are actually doing the full spectrum analysis for uh, <coughs> pervious, pervious pavement with uh, you know, we've done some borings to determine what our infiltration rates are. We are building our pavement so that we have a, a suitable substructure uh, because we don't want failure of the porous concrete. Thank you for answering my question. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gunning, Mr. May, did you have anything else? I, I don't have questions, but I'm when we're ready to discuss okay, it, we'll let's discuss. Just finish some questions. Mr. Gunning? Um, I, I guess it's a question. I mean, uh, you made it very clear that the PX is now under construction and is sort of not, um, not part of the conversation, but I will just point out, I think it's somewhat tragic that, they, that the PX and the commissary couldn't have been situated across the street from each other and, and created more of a, of a town center. Now one entire side of this development is all parking. Um, and in general, uh, and that's just really bad urban design in terms of getting, you know, you want two-sided retail and you could have actually had all of the same uses and all of the same parking even accommodated in a way that would have been a lot more pedestrian friendly and frankly made it more likely uh, that people would walk to those destinations. So I, I will just say it's a, it's a tragically missed opportunity and I'm sorry that, uh, uh, that the Army decided to go ahead with this project. Um, you know, bef uh, and, and not and not uh, taking the time to consider those uh, those other ideas. Other comments, questions? Yep. I'm sorry, um, you opened up the door with the word tragic. I, I I just have to say something about the design quality of these structures, even though we're a planning agency, and just a small suggestion, um, if you're going to, uh, I I note that we we advised a two-story building so there's this um, gesture toward the two-story building with these clear story windows that run the length of the mezzanine for the staff offices and even though they don't run the length of the building just as a gesture you might continue the the, the fenestration just for grins i mean it's um I, I am, it's just 
it's um, too bad. It could have been um, uh, much nicer on not just an urban design uh, context, but just from, from a, a, you know, this whole notion of, of retail and big stores, whether it's a commissary or a PX or whatever, you know, we, we, we came to some idea 25 years ago that big box stores equal town center somehow. And I don't, that's not the, the army's fault. Um, but that we're perpetuating that idea and calling this a town center is another uh, among the other tragedies here. Um, and I and I I get on figure eight the the forecourt. Um, it's a really nice attempt to green up and and make make some take away some of the impervious um, acreage on the site but but I would ask that you demand more of your designers because um, I cannot I don't know maybe people do hang out in front of the commissary um, and but this is this is not going to be a place where I, I think you're gonna spend a lot of money maintaining it um, all for naught um, unless people behave very differently on a on a um, army base than they do in regular life, and maybe they do, but um, I I just it just feels like enterprise lost. Sorry, can't help myself. I'll be quiet. Mr. May. Okay, so since we started down this path, <laughs> I couldn't agree more with both Ms. Mr. Goning's comments and Ms. Rice's comments. I mean, this is just, it, it, it's, it's almost painful having to review this because of the, the, the failings on an urban design level and on an architectural level. Um, I mean, the difference between a big box shopping center and a, and, and a town center is that you take one box and you turn it around and you face it to the other box. And they haven't even done that here. As, as, hmm? <laughs> And it's more than that. Well, it, it, I mean, but on, this, on the most basic level, and this is not, I mean, this doesn't come close to really being a town center. It's the idea of it, I mean, it's just, it, but it is what it is. It's, they are very big boxes, and I don't think that there's anything that we can do to change the fact that they're going to be building very big boxes. So, you know, I mean, the best we can hope for is better architecture and maybe some slightly better planning, and I'm not seeing either of them here. I, you know, I don't see that it's grounds to, at this point, say no because I think we've been down the saying no road before, and it doesn't seem to do very much. Although there is some evidence that it has done something, so I guess we have to accept this as what we're going to get in this circumstance. I mean, it just—I I agree wholeheartedly. This is just not very good. All the questions or comments? Uh, hearing none, um, is there a motion to approve the EDR as written? Please. Um, given how the commission members feel about this and given how without our approval the PX went under construction, why should we approve it is my question. Well, this is advisory, but we've also have made certain information requests that if we don't act on this whatsoever, we're not under any obligation to have, they're not any, under any obligation to, to bring to us. There is hope to do additional work on parking and such. I don't think it's very good not to act at all or to well, act I, in the negative. We don't have to act to approve. We don't well, have to act yeah. to approve. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that I agree with Mr. May, that we sh that we have no choice but to accept it. I mean, yeah, the the universe has no choice but to accept it. It's under <laughs> construction, but but sometimes symbolism is important, and um, bad design is bad design perpetrated by any part any federal entity, and I I find it hard to believe that if GSA were to bring a project of this design quality before the commission. Even though we are a planning commission, the lines between uh, planning and design are 
quite blurry sometimes. And I find it difficult to say we think that this is okay. And I'm not, I'm not just, I, I feel like this is Groundhog Day over and over and over again. And I, I don't get why we, we criticize and we say, please don't do this, we advise you not to do this, and then every time we say, but okay. So I'm not, I'm not inclined to vote for this. So I'm certainly not going to move it. And I probably will vote no, just because I think sometimes it matters to, to say, no, thank you. This is, you, maybe you've made some, some effort here, but it's not quite good enough. I, I would add, I mean, in response to that, I would just say that there, I think there actually has been a little bit of movement and a step in the right direction. Um, I mean, I, I think we're sending a fairly strong message by even having this discussion. Um, and I think that I would, I would hate to think that if we voted against it now, that the result would be that they would just ignore us, which is, you know, I mean, there's a, we have an official process for ignoring us, I know, but um, so I just, I, I think that, that if there's any progress at all and if the staff thinks that it's in our best, it's uh, best to advance this even if with a tepid vote in favor, um, maybe that is the best thing to do. So uh, just uh, a will, question. Hang on just a second. I will say that there has been progress made in staff consultation. For example, this is being built on a previously developed site. There has been um, advances made in parking and stormwater, and so there has been effective consultation and progress being made between the between the staffs. Um, um, I will say that. Also, I, I would say that uh, you know, some of this is bred by not having an updated master plan, as we all know. The status of the master plan is. Um, and again, reflecting on our meeting at DOD yesterday, um, to a, the Navy, the Army, and the Air Force, and military command all to a person understood um, not only why generally we want updated master plans, but they also understand that it's to their benefit process-wise to do this. So, uh, you know, I have no doubt of their commitment to getting us the, the, the master plans or they're working pretty diligently. On this particular master plan, I would say that, uh, correct me if I'm misremembering, but it was supposed to be to us this fall and they're three or four months behind and perhaps first of the year. So one could argue they're only three or four months behind, which is, um, which is perhaps something given that it's been years of uh, not having any at all. So those are my, my thoughts, Ms. Ms. Wright and then Mr. Hart. Um, and, and that's good, but it's Something. a day late and a dollar short, and it's Not just filling matter. out the paperwork, really. What I'm talking about is um, aspirational and, and setting standards that aren't necessarily those that are dictated by regulatory goals, but rather because it's just the right thing to do, right? And I think that we need to take a stand at some point and demand of one another. We may not always hit the mark, but we should be trying and we should require that of one another. I, and and, and uh, I think that matters. We're not disagreeing, Mr. Hart. In addition to the master plan, a portion of that is a transportation management plan. I don't see evidence in this that they're responding to the uh, objectives of the transportation management plan with respect to reduced parking, uh, numbers of employees for which there is parking. I, I need a master plan that makes sense in order to be able to vote on individual projects. And while there are a lot of architectural design issues that I take exception to, uh, and I applaud a lot of the environmental uh, steps towards, you know, improving the design. I have a basic problem with approving projects that are not in a master plan that's already approved, because that is the building framework that all these pieces fall into. Mr. Goning. 
So if part of what we want to do is to go on record signifying um, our disappointment, um, should we, should someone move to disapprove the plan, even should that, even if that motion should not carry, that would become part of the official record or not? A failed motion? I'm not certain that it would pass. Yes, a failed motion is part of the official record. Although I'm afraid if I, someone were to move that, that it might actually <laughs> I just be approved. That meaning that the, that the motion to disapprove might carry. One could always reconsider the motion. Is anyone willing to move either one? Um, I'm willing to make a motion to that effect, yes. And I, I am. second it. Well, uh, to disapprove. To disapprove. A motion is always in order. The chair entertains. But before, uh, Mr. Wells, did you have? In understanding the reluctance to vote against this, is there a concern of testing the jurisdictional relationship of what our action is, or what is the ramifications? I mean, is there um, concern that there'll be precedent by forcing an agency to ignore us, or what? What is the concern? Um, I could take it. I could answer that. Um, it does trigger our process, and so in the last round with the PX, the commission actually voted to disapprove that project, and that it forced at that time the applicant to respond, you know, in detail why they were going to do certain things. And that final approval, uh, or the final approval step, the commission again disapproved it. And at that time, they documented why they weren't going to comply and basically said, we're going ahead and build it. So what it does, it does trigger a process. I do think it got their attention in some aspects with this project, uh, but fundamentally it didn't address the commission's core concerns. Uh, that they had expressed at, the, at that time. So, so if this motion um, passes, it'll trigger another, the same process again? Yes. 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 And so the, um, the purpose of the motion is to send a message by hopefully it not passing because we don't want to put them through the, the process I mean, There again? are two options here. One is not taking action at all. And basically you've, the, the commission has ceded its ability to make any comments regarding this project. Second is if you could take an affirmative action or a negative action, uh, you are in fact sending comments back to the applicant expressing your concerns about this project, and at least those concerns would be placed on record. Uh, so I think in response to Ms. Wright's uh, concerns, that would at least document your concerns uh, regardless of whether you like it or not, and at least you relay that to the applicant in terms of uh, you know what those concerns are. So I think that's the difference. One is just you're not saying anything and the applicant is free to proceed. The second option, which is to vote on something, would at least allow you to put on record whatever comments that you may have. Um, I do think in some respects the comments make some difference. Um, I do think in this case they're basically small level interventions uh, just because the Army at, that, at this point in time is not able uh, to make any significant modifications to the site plan uh, in terms of where the buildings are located. So everything that you're seeing right now are essentially uh, small-scale interventions. I would remind the commission uh, that in, at the last meeting they actually had proposed uh, a plan for the other portion of this town center, which I do think is significantly better uh, than what they had proposed, which is more of the small-scale retailing, the residential areas or whatever, which this would tie into. So I do think at least the commission at that point got the message across that something had to be done overall with the, with respect to this project. Uh, so I do think there are you know, hopefully vast improvements in that portion of this area, but unfortunately with respect to the PX and commissary, these are indeed just small interventions. And um, so regardless of that, I think you, you do have choices here. Uh, I do hear your concerns. I do share those concerns also, but I think with respect to the staff's work, uh, we are just trying to make sure that this project, you know, regardless of how much intervention we can conduct in this area, um, is, is as good as it can be. Um, and that I do agree that a lot of this is small scale, uh, but I do think they will make some difference in terms of the quality of the project. And they could move, they could do more, uh, but I think uh, that's, uh, that's the point. The other piece of it is um, there were a lot of questions about parking and traffic 
and the number of spaces that they need. And I do think Mr. May made a good point. The question is whether they could consolidate it within one facility or do they need two. Uh, this action would defer uh, a decision on the remainder of the site plan. So at least they could come back and show you kind of a revised version of that if, and whether they could accommodate these uh, issues that you've raised or not, at least with respect to the parking and the road layouts and other portions of it that aren't, that aren't related to the building. So that is the other thing that this recommendation would do is to at least bring that back to the table, at least work those things through so you won't have, so at least you won't have major traffic problems on the site. Let's remember this is preliminary approval for the building plan, so they still have to come back to us for the final, and it's a deferred preliminary approval of the site, site plans. So they, they still have a way, they still have to come back before us. Yeah. So with that, the chair would entertain a motion, any motion. I don't, what was the to dis, so it was articulated okay and it was a second yes so the motion on the floor is to disapprove the EDR as written the no. hearing no to, to disapprove the plan as submitted to disapprove okay. indeed so, hearing no further discussion. Can I just ask one question <coughs> to make sure I understand? So does the staff have any changes to your proposed action based on the discussion of the commission today? Because your proposed action is to approve the building with comments and defer approval of the site. So does that still stand as the staff reaction or um, staff action? Rather? I think that could work. I think the key is, again, kind of the at least at this point the traffic and parking issues at least we would like them to come back and bring that to back to the commission at least in terms of understanding kind of really what's going on with respect to transportation in the area they think these recommendations do that i think you are making a statement with respect to the disapproval in terms of you know the building itself but i think this and the defers will at least leave the site development issues in play um, until we get further information on that and we could still work through that um, so the the well, make sure I understand the, the the motion is to amend the EDR to say disapprove instead of approve. Okay. And then everything else is the same. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's been moved and seconded. All in favor of amending the EDR as noted, say aye. 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 You mean disapproving? Yeah. Yes. Aye. Opposed? No. No. Uh, just make sure all in favor of a disapproving. disapproving one, two, three, four, five, and um, those voting the other way <laughs> one, one, two, three, four. So it passes five to four. Um, I'm going to vote to to approve. To I'm sorry, you're voting. Against the motion. Oh, against the motion. Against the motion. Against the motion. Then I think you need to recount. Five to five. It is five to five. It's five to five. Fails to pass. Fails to pass. No, no action. No action. Okay. Did the chair vote or do you? Do you I did. Okay. Five to five. It's tied. Okay. I want to make it approved the way it is. Excuse me. Oh. I make a motion to approve it. Huh? This, Dr. Glatz, you cannot vote. Is that right? Okay, I'm sorry. But I was. So the, the first motion was passed. fine. Oh, that's right. Because she cannot vote. I was assigned to, to represent the provider today. We have to have a letter from the Secretary of Defense saying that you are sitting for him. Well, I thought that was done. So that is probably someplace in email. I'm sorry. So it's five to four then, yeah? Yes. Okay. It passes. It passes. The motion to disapprove passed five to four. Yes. Okay. Agenda item 6A. Could I just make a point, excuse me, sir? I, I think 
it's important to note that if unless the assignment of to, for the alternates includes the ability for them to vote they can't vote so therefore you who have multiple levels should make sure if another alternate is appearing they have the authority to vote Agenda item 6A is an information presentation on the National Mall Design Competition, uh, focusing on Constitution Gardens and, Sylvan, and the Sylvan Theater. We have Ms. Hirsch. Welcome. Wow. Good afternoon. The National Park Service is here with the Trust for the National Mall to provide two information presentations um, on two different sites on the National Mall. The first is the Sylvan Theater and the Washington Monument grounds, and the second is for Constitution Gardens. Uh, the Trust for the National Mall, as you know, held a design competition last year for these sites and um, in an effort to advance the ideas in the National Mall plan. And um, at this point, staff has had early consultation with uh, the Park Service and the Trust. And essentially, the projects are just at the very early stages. And we anticipate that um, <clears throat> we would the projects would be coming before the Commission in the next year or so. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Park Service and the trust to um, introduce the projects and the, the designers. Um, are you looking at me? Because I didn't, I, I thought that uh, maybe S Steve Lorenzetti, did you want to say any opening remarks to kick things off before you pass it on to uh, the, the trust? I didn't know you were looking at me either. I, it's news to um, me, sorry. Thank you for letting us come and present uh, the trust is our partner. They are helping us with the implementation of the National Mall Plan. <coughs> they have run a design competition for two of our sites, uh, Constitution Gardens, which has uh, an east end that was never quite completed in the original SOM design, as well as a reimagining of how we should use the Sylvan Theater on the Washington Monument grounds. Uh, we're working closely with the trust to to have these projects come to at least one of them come to fruition before our centennial and with that I'd like to turn it over to Caroline Cunningham with the trust good afternoon thank you so much for your time um, my name is Caroline Cunningham I'm the president of the trust for the National Mall um, and as both Peter and um, uh, Steve mentioned we held a design competition run by Don Statsny. Many of you know him. He uh, developed the design excellence guidelines for GSA and we ran a national competition last year culminating in May in three designs, one for Constitution Gardens, one for Washington Monument Grounds at Sylvan Theater and one for uh, Union Square in front of the Capitol. Uh, unfortunately, um, I, I think all of the designs are, are stunning. Um, unfortunately, Union Square was um, taken by uh, Congress in December of 2011 um, in their omnibus um, or their continuing resolution. Uh, I don't know which, which uh, format of their budget they passed last year. Uh, the Trust for the National Mall um, wanted to present this uh, information to you and I have to tell you we have been working um, as a part of the steering committee of the design competition with the District Office of Planning, the National Capital Planning Commission, the Smithsonian, the National Gallery of Art, the Commission on Fine Arts. Um, we wanted to make certain that uh, all voices while we were developing the programs for these um, uh, uh, elements were involved in the outcomes. The jury, um, which I think was um, not only very helpful to us, but I think uh, came together, made a unanimous decision on the final outcomes of these each of these locations. And I think what they, um, they delivered to us was really quite stunning. I think all of the designs are um, respectful of the historic context of the park. They also restore the park in a, a more meaningful, sustainable way, um, in particular on uh, Constitution Gardens, which never really um, could sustain the quality of environment given the soil and the water uh, systems. And um, 
we are very proud to present these to you. The purpose really of this discussion is to get your input before we start discussing alternatives. We wanted to make sure that you know you had at least um, exposure with these plans um, so that you could uh, provide us some guidance as we take the next step. And the next step is working through alternatives um, and getting a very good handle on costs associated with both of these projects. And at that point, we would turn it over what we think probably in February of next year, beginning of March, over to the Park Service and our Board of Directors with a very strong um, understanding of costs so they could make a determination on what project to go forward with. Then we would go through the natural um, alternatives process, the NEPA process, the 106 process, um, and uh, take what you will see as original concepts um, to final design. Um, we anticipate that process will get us to about 2014 while we um, uh, at the same time raise the funds for these projects. Uh, and then as Steve said, complete one of the projects by 2016 as a gift to the nation for the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. Mm -hmm. Um, I am very honored by um, the quality of work that were done by the designers that were chosen, um, and I'm very grateful to the people who are here who participated on the design competition and the technical advisory group. Um, I think that they helped to shape this project in a, in a very important and um, in, in an outcome I think that will benefit not only the country but the district as well. So I will start with Adam in Constitution Gardens. Good afternoon. I'm Adam Greenspan, a partner at PWP Landscape Architects, and we, with Rogers Marvel Architecture, um, submitted the competition scheme for Constitution Gardens. What we realized when we uh, started our work here was that um, Peter Walker, who's been working in D.C. for 50 or 60 years, and I for 20 years, uh, neither of us knew Constitution Gardens by name or where it was. Um, <laughs> where it is, sorry, is uh, is around the Vietnam Memorial site um, and uh, over uh, where that box is uh, adjacent to the mall proper. The interesting thing about it is it's a curvilinear design, a place that's you know distinctly different from uh, the rest of the mall. It's less monumental, uh, more natural in a sense. When we looked at the history of it, um, we definitely see it as um, curvilinear, but definitely uh, related to modernism, a more biomorphic modernism like the Roberto Burl Marx uh, paintings and drawings. And we were definitely drawn to uh, the sinuous line that made the edge and makes the edge today of the pond, um, the fantastic reflection that you get of the Washington Monument and anything around it. Um, so we were committed to maintaining these uh, these significant character uh, aspects of the, the piece itself uh, in any new design, but also um, we were looking at uh, a lot of the problems that we have there today. This is that sinuous edge today in a number of different areas, and that's really emblematic of a lot of deterioration and a lot of uh, death and dying. Um, Two-thirds of the trees that were planted in 1976 uh, have died, S many of those replaced once or twice over. Um, the soils there really aren't healthy uh, and are dying and literally slumping into the ground. So the form that we had in the beginning um, is not there anymore. The lake itself really was only aesthetic. It wasn't something that was connected to the land and to, to life. And what we believe is that this, uh, this place, Constitution Gardens, can become a place with a really special kind of life on the mall, different than every other place uh, on the mall, not monumental, um, a respite away from the larger scaled areas, um, and in some ways the, you know, a place for smaller groups uh, rather than crowds. What we were looking at was uh, some of the existing trees and the way that um, the trees in the lower areas, the lower elevations in this gray space here, were the trees that were found to be mostly uh, dead and dying, um, the reds, the oranges, the yellows in this plan, versus the greens. And there were still some green and healthy blue trees, uh, as mapped in this uh, survey, in the upper areas, uh, the higher elevations. And this is because the soil here was slumping, uh, it was waterlogged, and the trees 
weren't able to deal in the conditions that um, they've been given. There's a lot of construction debris that's likely in the soil there, left from uh, architecture that had been on the site before construction, and that was just left underneath. So the heart of our scheme uh, can be you know, expressed in this section. This is Constitution Avenue over here. Um, this is the existing lake elevation. And we're proposing enhancing the topography all around the lake so that you get this series of rolling hills. And those rolling hills are more like the original grading plan that SOM did um, that has sunk over time. But we're talking about enhancing that even more so that you have uh, a feeling of enclosure um, and, in feeling, and a feeling of envelopment in this landscape. So when you come from the bigger space of the mall, the traffic of Constitution Avenue, you come through gateways between those hills uh, and enter into a space that will be full of life, integrated life, both uh, or all people, plants, and animals uh, together. So when we look at this, um, this is the level of the existing grade today. In the past, it was probably up a little bit higher than that. We're proposing putting in a continuous uh, drainage layer of sand so that this entire construction drains well and lives in a healthy way uh, in the future. One other thing that our scheme does is tries to connect um, the paths and the experience of Constitution Gardens to the memorials uh, around it, the Washington, I mean the uh, World War II Memorial as well as the Vietnam Memorial, but also connecting in a more visible and, and more celebrated way to all of the streets uh, coming from the north that, that go into the park. Um, so even though we do have that um, undulating edge with uh, the raised topography, there are points where those come down and you're able to walk in. Um, between a small, uh, a low wall that runs around, a seat wall that gives the, the, the gardens an identity and a place for naming. We've also connected um, the Vietnam Memorial uh, to an adjusted path system that flows very smoothly and effortlessly from the end of the Viet Vietnam Memorial so that when you come out of that, you can either continue on into the gardens or you continue back uh, to the interpretational uh, area related to Vietnam. So what we end up having is a garden that's connected both to DC and the rest of the mall. And inside of that garden, um, inside of those edges, which are surrounded by the topography and a continuous wooded edge that you can see here. Um, we have a lot of nooks and crannies, large spaces and small spaces, where people, uh, there can be events as well as uh, smaller, less organized activities for people as they go through. This is an elevation looking south uh, from Constitution Avenue. So you see the landform goes up and down, up and down. Each of these points down are those breaks in that low wall as well as that landform. So they offer um, a big welcoming entry into the gardens, but also views. Um, right now this is an elevation so you can't see it, but when you, if you were standing or in your car here, you would get a, a view across the lake all the way across to the gardens and the flowering displays on the other side. Another episode that exists today in the garden is the 56 Signers Memorial. Um, we're maintaining that memorial on that island, uh, but enhancing it through making a better threshold, a nicer bridge, and coming across uh, a wetland area and through sort of a scrim of, of willows onto uh, the more open island, um, adding magnolias to that so this really becomes something that's set off in the seasons and that you get a different view across the lake. Some of the most interesting ideas in, in, we felt in, in the competition were um, putting elements within the lake that maintain its uh, reflection and maintain the, the ways that it contributes today, but also um, expand either its health uh, and the way that it's integrated with the rest of the garden and, and uh, ecology um, or uh, social activity. So one of those ideas is the um, water ring it's something that um, exists at the far eastern end of the, the lake and is about the size of a hockey rink. Um, this is a space that we think can be drained um, and uh, turned into an ice skating rink, um, something that feels more like you're skating on a frozen pond than skating in an urban setting uh, on a plaza or something like that. Um, in the summer, 
if you drain it only slightly, uh, it reveals a path and a walkway that runs around that slightly lower space in the center. So that becomes a venue for um, model boating, like in Central Park or in Paris. Uh, and fishing on National Fishing Day uh, is something that already takes place there uh, every year. Um, but this will be uh, a new way to experience and get into the lake. So that lake is part of an integrated water system that um, we've really designed the, the whole gardens around. Um, we're hoping to collect r rain runoff and urban runoff from the buildings across Constitution Avenue, as well as our uh, building, a pavilion building that Rob will talk about momentarily. We're also looking at containing and collecting all of the uh, surface runoff and the sub-drainage um, into the lake so that that becomes then uh, the generator of irrigation water and the place where that water can be filtered and then recycled. Um, the existing uh, work that's being done that connects the reflecting pool to the tidal basin is something we also looked at continuing and connecting so that the lake can be flushed uh, periodically or topped off with tidal basin water as needed. So this represents an integrated topography of uh, the wooded edge at the highest levels with open lawns that are flexible and can be used uh, in different ways by people. Uh, and then upland and lowland gardens, a wetland shelf at the bottom, where water that moves through this is being filtered as it comes down, going into the ground, and then transported also in the subterranean uh, sand layer. Um, and then the pond itself is made much deeper um, so that it can be maintained in a healthy uh, condition and planted heavily around the edge um, so that it something you know more interesting to look at but also something that gets filtered uh, by those plants. So today this is the view that we're having and while this is a legacy and represents a couple of the aspects that we uh, wanted to maintain over time it also shows some of the problems um, and we're looking at the things that are liabilities today like the contaminated soil as being something that becomes an integrated part or an integral part of our construction. So the landforms that we're talking about um, can be made from the harvested contaminated soil on site so that this can be done in a rather uh, incremental way around the lake or around the site where uh, both trees and soil are harvested and moved. The healthiest trees we're proposing um, do get salvaged and become part of the woods that runs around the park. Um, whereas single trees that are specimen quality could be used as individual trees in open lawn areas. Um, so when you see this, this diagram here, this color represents the woods, uh, a sort of composed woodland that's made in part of the trees that we would harvest from the site but aren't of specimen quality but are in good health. Um, larger trees and then the wetland shelf and the, and the lower uh, plantings. So these are some images of the character of the spaces that we'll be developing. Um, and this shows really their distribution around the site. So we'll have upland and lowland gardens with different pallets, a wetland shelf, and a wood with understory underneath it, separating the maintenance needs of the different kinds of landscapes so the Park Service can maintain lawns and lawns only, main tree, maintain trees with ground cover on, under them in a different way. Even though we'll have these different types of landscapes and types of uh, expression in the garden, one thing that we tried to uh, focus on was the simplicity and the boldness of the original design. So as we have a palette in each of these gardens uh, of different plants to make something that uh, has interest in, and uh, shows itself over the seasons, each season should express itself um, clearly, you know, as one or two colors. And we're organizing that by uh, looking at different heights on the plants that bloom at different times of the year. So within that plan, we have an opportunity for a lot of different events. One uh, space I didn't talk about is an, a large outdoor amphitheater, um, as well as the pavilion that we have at the far eastern uh, edge of the site. Those two spaces are the most highly programmed um, spaces in the garden and the places that we can bring lots of people for organized events. 
Um, the building itself will be the hub for all of that activity that I just talked about. So we've looked at, instead of having a number of pavilions throughout this about 20 acres, mm -hmm. we're looking at having one place and one building that fits out and uh, is able to um, serve all of the activities that we have. This is an image of the amphitheater uh, and looking east to the pavilion. This amphitheater can range from about 100 people or a few people up to one or 2,000. This is at the far western end. The Vietnam Memorial is further to the left here. And the topography all around the uh, pond quiets the, uh, the sound of whatever goes on inside. We've had studies done so uh, different kinds of events or kinds of celebrations can happen in the garden and not um, impose themselves on the other activities adjacent to the garden. And lastly, this is an image uh, looking at um, what we envision for nighttime here. We use the historical lamp, but I think using lighting to um, both highlight the design that we have and also make it a safer and more usable place through much of the day is something that um, we're really aiming to do both through the day and through the year. Thank you. Uh, Rob Rogers, Rogers Marvel Architects. As, as we were working with Adam and, and Pete in their office, thinking about the building configuration for the site, which as Adam mentioned, is really about supporting the incredible programmatic opportunities of the rebuilt garden. We also looked at the legacy of the SOM and the Dan Kiley plan and began to imagine how those guide us today in terms of not just the reconstruction of the landscape, but the position and, and proposition for a building in that site. And one of the, the obvious things is to say that we really felt just as the hills and the low wall have begun the redefinition of Constitution mm -hmm. Gardens, this building as a pavilion, as a proposition, has to be a building that belongs to the garden. It's not a memorial, it's not a monument, it's, it's not of the scale of the mall as a whole, it's really particular to the garden. So it's kept low and it's within the canopy trees of Constitution Gardens. When we looked at the original site, uh, the SOM building was originally intended at the top of what is now a series of step terraces going down to the lake. And we felt that that uh, at the time may have been the right place, but since then the World War II memorial has been constructed and the formal axis exists now north and south from that axis and we really felt that it, that cannot be disrupted by a building in the current configuration. So we pushed the idea of the building to the west as indicated by the large red arrow and thought of it as a very simple pavilion. So now instead of coming up the terrace steps to arrive at a building, we actually push the building and steps together and begin to imagine it as a pavilion looking out over the lake, but the pavilion then is also a threshold moment to enter Constitution Gardens and announce that special place. And we started with a very simple rectilinear piece and just widened it and opened it up so it will favor the big long landscape panoramic view looking out across the lake and the gardens. It's also as uh, Adam mentioned, when you're moving through Constitution Gardens, it's a, it's a very spirited, curvilinear, lyrical kind of walk as you move in and out of the lake, especially now augmented by those gardens. And we felt that the shape needed to have a, a perspectival component so that it would dynamically change as you move around it throughout the garden experience. We also, after building this area up to meet all the current criteria to integrate with the work of the Army Corps and establishing the levee heights. Um, so this is the transit height correct to get across and then down into the World War II Memorial that we actually slope slightly up, lifting the pavilion as, a, as it sort of ramps up so that you've really got a porch and a prospect looking out over the new gardens. But it also gives us adequate space underneath for what will become an area of the concessions restrooms and classic park amenities, ice skating rental, boat rental, kite rental, things like that opportunities. So we've also proposed a plaza 
type space on the east side of the pavilion so that we've got a place for school groups and uh, interpretation, education and gathering as people move to and from the memorials um, and a place that actually the pavilion can expand. So I'm going to walk you through the pavilion now as sort of threshold and gateway to the gardens as you move down those large generous stairs great place for impromptu uh, activities and events down to the lake level um, with the concessions, restrooms, park facilities just to your left in this image. So the building is really split. There's, a, there's the, the big grand stair that takes you down to the lake level, the concessions, restroom, bathrooms on the lower level. We've incorporated very substantial service areas which will be accessed by an independent roadway so we can actually get the kind of service we need to really deliver food, pick up trash, manage some of the park's maintenance relationships. On the upper level, you've got the uh, very light ramp, only about 3% up to the prospect and the porch that looks out over the lake, and then a proposed restaurant and cafe whose service area is below. We've, we've proposed initially a diagrid structural system that will span across, creating a lattice that gives us the opportunity of both transparency um, and closed uh, areas where we want conditioned space and where we want open space. The pavilion is really the heart of the programming that will enable Constitution Gardens to become viable 365 days a year. And we're interested not just in the tourist who needs a moment to stop and rest, but the resident, the worker, the are in D.C. all the time, that this is a place that they can also come in and enjoy the mall in a park-like setting. And at the corner of Constitution and 17th, we've proposed the modest relocation of the Lockkeeper's House, which will become an interpretive center for the Constitution Gardens in the mall. And the, you can see the building is, is visible through the trees, but is not a major presence from that side. We believe this is a place for these kind of moments of respite and uh, recreation and refreshment along the mall. Um, looking forward to this being something that becomes part of the life of the city uh, throughout the year. Thank you very much. Okay. But this is very exciting. Yeah. Not the restaurant space, not the restaurant, it's not all the other things that people park to this. If you retire, you'll need some more of white tables. <laughs> We can either take quite, I mean, we, we were going to do both presentations and then take questions and comments, I'm or... If you, I'm just wondering if you're going to have to go back to images, but you might be oddly kind of toggling back and forth between presentations. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, please. So I like it. I think it's really beautiful. Um, my only question has to do with the topography changes and the, uh, the woodland um, areas. How deep and how um, visually impenetrable uh, are those areas? So my question is, what is the visibility, mostly for safety reasons, from the exterior of Constitution Gardens through the woodland features? And I think that's something that, you know, we're concerned about definitely also. And the idea there um, is that, I don't think we have to go to it, is that there will be a composed woodland with lower ground cover in there. So there may be a number of trunks coming down, but the goal of having mature trees limbed up um, no limbs branching below eight feet, you know, on these trees, um, and uh, a lower ground cover. The topography, you know, goes up um, a few feet, um, but these are large landforms, so it's not a berm that's, you know, discrete and singular where somebody could hide behind it. It's more like a hill, you know. So what you'll be seeing uh, will be 
these moments where you see from, from Constitution Avenue up to the peak of that hill. Um, and as you move through that space, you'll get uh, an expanded view of the other side as you move around. Um, you won't see on the other side of the hill, um, but you will see oblique views. And like I showed on the, um, the long elevation, uh, we do have this undulating change. Um, so it's not uh, an abrupt or sharp you know, bump where you can spend time on one side or the other. It's something that's a slow grade going down and slowly coming up again um, as you, you move through. So this will be closer to the scale of um, the areas around uh, the Washington Monument today, actually, um, in some spaces, those larger landforms, um, rather than uh, smaller berms, as you might think of. OK, but, but basically, if you're on Constitution Avenue, you really can't see any activity happening around Constitution Gardens except for those pathways that punctuate, right? And what's the distance between those, roughly? This is about, I'm sorry? No, ahead. there's a the section through there as well. This? From Constitution Gardens. Constitution Five of the Road. Oh, right. So you're asking what's the, what's the distance here? No, I'm asking the distance. So, so if, if uh, the distance of the, the landform between the separations, like is it a, as big as a city block? Is it, is it half a block? Is it 200 feet? Um, it's, it's right now today, uh, there's a very small opening um, or a small pathway coming across the street. This is about the width um, of the entire street. Um, so it's probably about 50 feet wide to 70 feet wide that we're at the flat opening in between, and then it begins to roll up on either side. Okay, so I'm, I'm not asking about the width of the opening. I'm asking the, the, the width of the area that, that because of the landform and the trees, you cannot see inside Constitution Gardens. So how big is that area in between the openings? Oh, okay. It, 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 it wouldn't be that you can't see inside, and we'll, we'll have to, w what we can do as we move forward is look at three-dimensional uh, topo models, but that is a block, that width okay. there. Um, and so um, this is roughly a block or two-thirds of a block, but as you're moving down, you will get views into this space through here um, because this slopes down, and in here we're at a low point. So you'll be getting views through um, it won't be a separate, completely okay. separate. I know, but what you're saying to me, though, and I think it is very beautiful, but you're going to walk the length of an entire block before you can look into Constitution Gardens again. Um, and, that, and that while you're in the opening, you'll be able to have a panorama, but when you're not standing in front of the opening or next to the opening, you're walking an entire block uh, when, you, when you don't have a sense of what the activity is inside. The... You will be seeing these windows obliquely as you move down, but yes, there will be about a block where you're not getting a view across the way. Mm -hmm. I would just express some concerns both about safety and about what kind of a experience that creates for the pedestrian on Constitution Avenue, somewhat a deadening experience for the pedestrian, that there might be wonderful activity happening but you're not really going to be able to be aware of it because all you're seeing is the rise of, a, of, a, of the landform and then trees, which, and no human activity, basically. I think that's something we have to definitely take into account and we'll look at. Um, and I think we'll want to make it so that you can see in a little bit more frequently than that. I'm sure you have it there, and I just didn't see it in the plan. I'm curious. The your microphone. Is. Sorry. Um, going back to your building, um, yes. I, I'm sure you have it in the plan, and I just didn't see it, but the, the ADA accessibility and how folks in wheelchairs would get from one level to the other. It's, it is there, and I'll take you there one moment. Right. Um, you, the, 
the terrace is really over this area of service below, and then it's the very modest slope up to this porch, and there's an elevator right here that goes both up and down, so that if you come at the lower level, you can ascend right there and have that porch experience, or if you're coming here, you can move up here and take that down as well. Thank you. There's also, and I'd have to go back to the plans, but there are pathways that make bad analogy, but elephant ears, if you will, on either side of the building that are come down at that very modest non-railing slopes. So they connect directly that sort of concentration, refreshment, concession areas to the plaza on the top. So there's still an outdoor alternative. That's correct. That's great. Thank you. On both the north and south sides. I think that uh, what we've been shown is very exciting. And I look forward to, you know, more refinement of the pavilion. I think that almost anything you could do to the gardens would be an improvement. But I'm excited about the kinds of landscaping that were described, um, the use of marsh and, and flowers in an area that is right now not real exciting. Uh, I'm not so troubled by the, you know, insertion of berms between the, the points of, of entry into the park. Uh, and. I, I like the, the fact there will be this um, topographic difference in, in introduced into the mall where it's basically a very flat landscape as it is now. And I think you're building on the SOM plan in a way that uh, will be very nice. Thank you. Can you um, take us to the, um, hmm. I guess it's the west elevation of the building. And the reason I ask, I think it's beautiful. And, and I shouldn't say this, but I will. It reminds me of the ICA in Boston. And one of the problems with, with the ICA is the back of it. It turns its back on the city and it's beautiful on, um, on the harbor. But the, the uh, so I'm, I guess it, uh, I was wrong, the eastern. I'm directionally challenged. The eastern facade. The right hand side. The the one facing the Washington <laughs> Monument. That one. What would be the back of this building? I don't think the building has a back. Okay, well then I need to look at it more carefully. I mean it sort it's of feels like to. a back, doesn't it? I think it's you know, the building is really uh it's a threshold. It's an open yeah, air. And it's, it's, it's right now, it's very yeah, much. theater um, sort of thing. It's hard to even call it a building because it's still a bit of an idea at this stage, but it's, it's that place that is both containment and threshold. So there's no wall here at all? There's an enclosure, glass enclosure of the restaurant and cafe. Okay. And then the diagram actually comes down like a, a lattice work and trellis work. Right. And we imagine that this is as is very transparent and porous, and mm -hmm. this is obviously conditioned in enclosed space. So it's not turning its back on anything. Well, that's great. You should be able to sit here and have a beautiful view of the Washington Monument with a Cabernet or Chardonnay. <laughs> and we'll know the difference standing here. What, where's the, where, is, where are your mechanical systems? The north side, or where are you going we, to hide do, all these things? There's the look at this plan. Yeah, okay, got, that's uh, what I thought. The stairway, the service elements, service elevator, small uh, accessible bathrooms specific to the restaurant because the large bathrooms are downstairs through the public uh, entryway and elevator. And this is also the service core that goes down to the lower level which has got um, the public bathrooms here. Right. This is all okay. the kitchen service, right. park service area in the back. And we are, we, we, we are looking that we would have potential vehicular access actually pass through here um, oh. for the Zamboni. Oh, oh. <laughs> the Zamboni, of course. Like <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I think it's, Wonderful. I, I was telling John that w when I was in college at GW, we used to go down there all the time 
but nobody knew it was called Constitution Gardens, and believe it or not, this was the 80s, and even then it was long in the tooth. So I hope you're thinking really hard about the surfaces, because I remember even then, when it must have been only seven or eight years old, um, spalling and it, it was falling apart from the beginning. So I can't remember what the surfaces are, but I'm assuming you're going to use something different. Right. And that, I mean, they, they were, it was a lot of asphalt and a lot of chip seal thing, and then holes in those for trees and things like that. And all of this, uh, the materials, the methods, uh, and the integrated design that we're looking at are both about making a system that works today, but something that'll be maintainable and long lasting. And in that, to that vein, we're just beginning to test some material ideas, but one of the things we've really talked about a lot is in fact, if not the direct reuse of the stone that is in the terraces now, mm -hmm. very similar kind of stone that makes this base level so that we keep the recall of that threshold series of terraces that uh, are there from the SOM plan now. Terrific. Other questions or comments? Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes. Uh, There's oh. another part of the presentation. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yep. Sylvan. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm Marion Weiss from Weissman Freddy. This is Hallie Boyce from Olin. And Partner we're, at Olin. We're, we're very thrilled to be uh, selected to design the Washington Monument grounds at the Sylvan Theater and honored to present today. Um, what is very interesting is that as we were learning about the history of the Sylvan Theater, we thought that it was interesting to think that the mall is our nation's central stage just to begin with. And when Alice Pike Barney in 1916 conceived of and in 1917 realized the Sylvan Theater as the first venue for cultural performing events on the mall, that that was an extraordinary change and a real gift. The site as it stands though today is something that we might not know is really at the almost at the heart of the crisscross of the two axes of the mall and then the, the, the White House and the Jefferson. So that propitious location has taken a beating just as many others have. And so the possibility of looking at this site with such care and focus is one that really allows us to see that where the question mark is is this strange phenomena where the audience is on the mound and the performers are across the pathway uh, on the other side. And similarly, they're looking towards the buses now as well as the, as well as the theater. So the audience turns its back to the monument, which we think is really uh, something that seems quite strange. And those who are now arriving by buses on Independence, Independence Avenue have a flurry of pathways that are still unclear about the invitation to arrive at the, at the mall or the theater. So for us, there were fundamental things that caught our mind. And one was that we wanted to return the theater now to this site so that the amphitheater and the audience would face the monument, and people, when they were looking at performers, could also see the monument, but that we might also recognize its connection to the uh, monument grounds to the south with the tidal basin and see this as not, not an edge but a center. And so the first idea was to include the Washington Monument in all the scales of performance. And by lifting the landscape, what we were able to do was to create a theater for about 1,000 and then offer uh, another benefit, which was to take this new topography and, and capture some of the uh, park uh, services uh, offices and, and uh, park ranger station, but more importantly, conceal the buses, because that's the fundamental view that people have from the monument. The other thing, though, that caught our mind was that the Sylvan Theater had a name, but no identity of Sylvan within this site. And Shakespeare's idea of the forest really captured our imagination to offer both shade and shelter and identity, and then ultimately also think of a connection simultaneously. So our vision was really to think of this as something that is an enhancement of the landscape and landform, and a there there with shade, shelter, and performance, and potentially future connections to the south. This setting there, and, you, and uh, with some apologies to the lightness of the plan, shows that there's a sylvan pavilion that is a hinge between 15th and Independence, a, a two plazas north and south, and an unfolding path landscape that allows us to now look 
for instance, to our left is the Sylvan Theater. We're looking across at all the buses. But if we have a performance, we can imagine that the topography might actually change the perspective to one of uh, a hillside, but studiously pull those uh, topography down and pull the trees apart to open up and keep the views clear towards the uh, Jefferson Memorial and offer gateways now with the Sylvan Pavilion to the left in the amphitheater again with those views exposed. But the question is that this is not just a place for performance, but it's a place of respite, a place to be day to day, a place that should be accessible at all times uh, for wheelchairs as well and flexible so that if one is imagining a place of performance for about 10,000 leveraging all the sides of the mound and the new amphitheater, that we can also understand that this is reframing an historic gateway. And looking now as if we're coming from the metro, we see Monument Lodge, which is a, a real gift, but to our left, we, you can also see that there's no sense of front doors or gateways. So this is about offering several gateways, including this one here, that says that where the Sylvan Pavilion opens up, keeps itself down as part of the landscape and opens up views uh, to the monument. And similarly now on Independence Avenue where the buses are all lined up, that there really should be a sense of arrival at the mall instead of this confusion. And that this, uh, to the left you could see where the parks service offices are, restrooms for a high number of restrooms and exhibition give you your bearings. And on the right, the Sylvan Pavilion, which is really a complementary landform with a green roof, is to your right. And the, that, the other side, then, is the other uh, face where the Sylvan Cafe opens out onto the terrace. And you could see that in many ways, this is really as much a landscape as it is a theater. And it's one, though, that the intersection between what is architecture and what is landscape is also connected through sections so that small performances inside and even to the edge can take on a new life so that even the sylvan identity that we see dappled light through the trees could also give configuration and shape and identity what the interior of this pavilion might be like. And so if we look at these all together, this really is a kind of fully connected and rejuvenated landscape uh, with new identities and landscape layer that Halle will describe. And like Olin's design for uh, the composition at the base of the Washington Monument that you see in the plan on the left. Uh, we really began our uh, design exercise with this idea of creating landform, sculpting the land to make place, uh, as well as using uh, tree plantings in particular to uh, frame a new venue here, a green respite on the mall uh, that would allow for the, the critical visitor amenities uh, badly needed at, at its heart. Um, the uh, plantings reinforce the sculpting of the land uh, of the amphitheater, providing a shady respite. Uh, and we worked to um, maintain a lot of the existing trees that are somewhat mature uh, on the west side um, to, uh, in order to um, create a new setting for uh, the um, survey lodge that's right here and uh, further embellish those plantings. Uh, while we sculpted the ground plane, we also kept the sculpting minimal uh, in this area to protect those trees, but to also tuck back um, under the landform uh, some of the necessary parking that's required uh, as part of the current program, which we'll be uh, reviewing further uh, with the Trust and the National Park Service uh, as we begin uh, the design phases. Um, but this was looked at at the larger context, uh, preserving the overall structure of the mall. The light green uh, shows the very ordered plantings of the mall, the elms, the boss, the alleys along the streets. Uh, the uh, light pink, which I think is very light at the moment. <laughs> um, let me see if I can highlight this for you. Um, the cherry trees that we all know, uh, excuse me, are uh, around the uh, tidal basin along here. Uh, Olin also proposed cherry trees that would frame uh, the Washington Monument site as well. It's this dark green plantings, the more random plantings uh, like uh, those referred to um, by Adam uh, at Constitution uh, Gardens, which really uh, lent this idea of the Sylvan Grove uh, a wilder place on the mall, if you will. 
So our proposal uh, works to uh, rework the ground plane to use lawn minimally and to propose uh, conservation areas uh, in, the, in the lighter tan, uh, much like that of Hyde Park in London. Uh, these are meadow landscapes using native grasses, which uh, infiltrate water better, uh, which uh, attract wildlife and uh, create uh, uh, an easier time for the National Park Service with regards to maintenance. It minimizes uh, maintenance considerably. Uh, at the same time, we wanted to propose tree plantings that would not only um, uh, uh, attract the wildlife, but would also have seasonal interest in proposing uh, fall uh, color in particular around uh, the monument and the green amphitheater. Uh, these are the variety of species that would, one would find here, and we think this gives uh, the Park Service additional opportunities to educate the public, uh, the million of chil millions of children that come here as well about our environment and uh, the need to uh, make homes for these, uh, these creatures. Uh, and uh, this is the view back to uh, the Lincoln Memorial. Um, this place, uh, while it accommodates all the structured events that Marion talked about, can also be used uh, a place just to take in the view, to have a lunch or meet with a colleague um, and uh, simply play. Uh, at the same time, uh, the design keeps this place that's so important at the heart of the mall very open to allow for uh, a, a range of programs and a range of activities, uh, the celebrations, the demonstrations, as well as the recreation that occurs here on a daily basis. Uh, but we know it needs to be a resilient landscape, and when you're talking about the surfacing, uh, the project on the east end of the mall that's moving forward is very exciting, this need to uh, create even the lawn spaces which can endure these flows of people, uh, whether large or small. Uh, the design allows for circulation to occur even during an event from east to west and maintains that path just to the south of the uh, mound at the Washington Monument. Uh, we have uh, considered the uh, access, as Marianne stated, uh, where buses will land on 15th as well as Independence Avenue to the south, uh, and how maintenance will occur on site, and we'll be talking further with the National Park Service along those lines. Uh, with regards to uh, accessibility, um, the majority of uh, the amphitheater will be accessible, and our gesture of this pedestrian bridge that connects over uh, Independence a uh, Avenue, the aspiration there is that that would also be um, completely ADA. It's currently, uh, we determined that we could keep that 5% uh, or less. Um, we talked about uh, preserving, conserving, and extending this landscape to the west, uh, creating a new setting for uh, the Survey Lodge. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Uh, today, there are rangers there who are very helpful to the public, so we'd like to keep that aspect. But also, uh, this idea of uh, creating volunteer programs where the National Park Service rangers become the experts and might take teams of people around the site uh, to help take care of the site um, or uh, help with some of the programs there. Uh, we think it would really help connect uh, the mall to the local community in an engaging way. Um, and this just shows some of those ideas about the Survey Lodge uh, immediate environment, some smaller scale uh, sort of working landscapes, if you will. Um, so there was really a need to uh, invent anew here, uh, but, but to pick up on the uh, existing Washington Monument uh, mound and landform at the same time, uh, to enrich it with uh, several layers of planting, uh, and create uh, an exciting uh, place for people to rest and refresh. Uh, we wanted to also make larger connections uh, to the tidal basin and beyond. Um, we looked and understood that there's the memorial loop, which is very interesting because it connects currently uh, both the Constitution Garden site as well as our site and the tidal basin. It's all within a five minute uh, walk, the tidal basin is. Um, we also considered the various users of this site, um, whether it be families, 
uh, the large flows of school groups via those buses on Independence Avenue. Um, we know there's a quite a running community here um, in DC, particularly around the Tidal Basin. Uh, trying to pick up on the DC bike share program, which is so successful and uh, growing. Um, uh, allow for connect ease of connections to the World War II and uh, Vietnam Memorial. Uh, and then also think of uh, ease of access uh, for those of, of senior years, uh, as well as the uh, advent of the new Segway, a new way to get around town. Mm -hmm. Um, we also thought about, uh, in the southern portion, uh, the image on the left. Uh, in the late 19th century, uh, this area was a working landscape. There were uh, plots and greenhouses that um, allowed for uh, the refurbishment of the mall and its gardens, particularly some of da Downing's ideas, A.J. Downing. Um, and we thought there might be a potential in the future um, uh, to bring that idea back in some some way, um, but more immediately this idea of uh, making this a landscape of performance, of uh, only uh, putting lawn where the high traffic areas are required and then um, planting the rest with this mixed meadow, uh, really um, uh, making it uh, both um, uh, ease of maintenance but also much more sustainable for long term use. Um, we did also in the competition look at uh, a phased approach and we'll be talking further with the trust and the National Park Service about that, those ideas. Well, finally, as Hallie's uh, talked about a, a high performance landscape, we could say that the performance should also have new highs. So to close, it's really taking that historic idea that could take something as delicate as this performance or as robust as this one and think about what it might mean here to host roughly the Sylvan stage today, to host a thousand people with this reoriented stage with incredible vistas, to take this scalable landscape so that a hundred, a thousand, or 10,000 could work in this place it more intimately for performances It could be indoors or indoors and outdoors, or expandable venue when something extraordinary is going on. Of course, the most important thing is that when you have a theater, you've got, to, you've got to support it and you need to service it. So the idea is small performance are serviced in, in this particular route in the Monument Plaza area. And then larger performances with their trucks and the stage elevated just to the size of those box trucks allow that to be serviced as well. But most importantly, that when you have a stage in the center, it needs to be flexible and not too heavy of a structure so that it has a matrix or literally a scaffold beginning that could sustain, say, a trellis restaurant during the day, but you could see all these diagrams on the right all the way up to being removed and having all the rigging come in by another performance uh, artist. So that you can see on the playbill on the right, on the left you see small, medium, film, and large all being able to be accommodated in this one setting that we hope will, in fact, uh, incite the new Sylvan uh, magic, which we would imagine would induce new Horizons, thank you. It's very exciting. Uh, questions or comments for Sylvan Theater? Mr. Hart. I think you've shown us some very exciting ideas and you know, look forward to further refinement of them. There, there is a component that I do have some reservations about, and that's this pedestrian bridge. Um, I hesitate to. Um, get too warm on something that divorces pedestrians from the landscape itself by, you know, taking them over the road and for a long distance, you know, separating them from the ground plane. There are places where that makes sense, but I'm not sure that this is it. So as you go farther, you know, please think about, you know, what that is in the landscape and in the streetscape that we're putting together. Thank you. Ms. White. I just wanted to make a couple of comments and thank first the Park Service and the Trust for the vision and the leadership that you brought to this in the design competition alone. But I, I was really struck by the power of your partnership in really elevating the thinking and what could be done. And I really compliment the design teams for the, the grace and the thoughtfulness that you've taken in your approach. 
and it's very clear you've thought a lot about sustainability and stewardship in the, in the way you've approached these spaces. And I, I just think it's breathtaking, and I know there are a lot of details that, you know, you'll be working out and, and um, so forth, but I really appreciate coming here this early on because it's really an inspiring vision. So I, I really wanted to commend you all for that. So thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, I will just say, uh, this is mostly to Carolyn, that this is wonderful. Uh, we were delighted to be able to participate in the, uh, you know, in the selection, and uh, they are both designs, I think, very inspiring. I think we, you know, we look forward to seeing them again. We have some ideas about how they might change and some concerns, but uh, to say that they're enormous improvements over the current conditions is, you know, is a, is a vast understatement, <laughs> and, um, and that and that they uh, they really are you know uh, both very imaginative, um, uh, beautiful uh, spaces that would be uh, uh, that they'd be jewels in the crown of any city, and we'll uh, we, we will be very lucky to realize them here in Washington. So thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very excited. We look forward to having you back. Can I ask one question. Yes. And I. I refer to Harriet because I was sure she was going to ask about where the buses go. But where do the buses go in, in your, I mean. The, the buses? Where do the buses go? Steve? <laughs> I don't think we've got there yet. To be honest, the Park Service has not really weighed in on this plan yet. Uh, we're working out a few details so we can weigh in. We want to make sure we respect the NEPA process and the 106 process. But buses are certainly something we'll be looking at when we get an opportunity to come. Where did you imagine the buses well, were the going buses, to go? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like those ferries. The, 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 the buses, they're still there, they're right? They're right. The buses are still there on Independence, but they're now right. screened by the new topography of the amphitheater. So in, in some ways, we actually like the reciprocity of the elevation, still allowing the buses to be there. And actually now with the Monument Plaza, that we the Sylvan Plaza, they have a, a gateway now, as opposed to this strange condition that they have right now. Right. So, I would also say that um, Bob Vogel has assured me that he's finding a location to stick the buses. So, I mean, I don't know that, yeah. they were, that they're a part necessarily of the design. Clearly, I love that they disappear in the Washington Monument grounds um, topography change. But I, I honestly think that, you know, figuring out where the buses go is a city slash park service question. Agree. But, I mean, uh, but but you're st you're designing with the idea that the buses don't go away right realistically right. the idea is that the reciprocity between the yeah. high tourism at that location and and this landscape might work together okay thank you thank you very, thank much. You very much thank you it's very exciting plans so we look forward to having you back um noting that there's nothing else to come before us that i sense um we are we are adjourned <laughs>